The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. It's time for the Guillotine Grapevine, a podcast for the land of 10,000 wrestlers. 10,000 wrestlers. Now, here's your host, award-winning wrestling broadcast journalist, Jason Bryant. It's episode 18 of the Guillotine Grapevine. Jason Bryant here with you. We've recovered from Fargo with a great performance from the Minnesota Cadets and Juniors, but we've got the Olympic Games coming up, and what better treat to bring you, the Minnesota wrestling fan, than an Olympian from 2012 who cut his teeth at St. Michael Alberville, now on television every single week at part of the WWE Universe. You knew him as Chaz Betts, now WWE superstar Chad Gable. It's going to be weird to call you Chad here, but uh, welcome to the Guillotine sure. Grapevine. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, okay, so the people that know you, is it hard for them to kind of start, you know, what do you prefer to be called by your friends? Just Do you still go by Chaz, or do you have to have that the WWE kind of uh, attitude on the, the entire time? Well, I guess it kind of depends who... Uh who I'm actually with at the time. And no, everybody down here knows me. It pretty much calls me Gable or Gabes or, you know, they, they've all got little nicknames, but it's Chad Gable down here. Uh, most of them don't really know me as, as Chaz or Betts or anything, but uh, when I'm home or dealing with anybody that I knew, you know, before I started this stuff, I'm not, I'm definitely not going to expect them to call me Chad or, or Gable. I think that'd be a bit weird anyway. Yeah, like if you showed up to like a wrestling tournament to watch, you know, Andy Bisek or something, be like, hey, what's up, Gable? And everybody expects to see Dan sure. Gable instead yeah, of, yeah. Instead of Chad Gable. Yeah, I don't know how well that would work out. Uh, so we'll just stick with Chaz as far as that goes. Yeah, for the purposes of this interview. Now, uh, you know, we'll, I'll probably waffle because it's it's weird because growing up, as a professional wrestling fan before I knew what wrestling was, you know, I'm, I'm, I was a complete mark growing up, you know, I, I, you know, my favorite heel, the people that I, I loathe the most were like the honky tonk man and Jimmy Hart. Sure. So growing up, what was it like for you? I've got a little bit of, a little bit of age on you, but who were the guys that you really watched and enjoyed watching growing up in, in professional wrestling? It makes you go like, man, you know what? I'd like to do this someday. So the first th- real thing that I remember kind of catching my eye was that when I was the youngest I can remember anyway, was Lex Luger. Uh, coming down from a helicopter and like slamming Yokozuna. Oh, on the I love ship. that and, one. Like, yeah, that was at great. My, at the time, with, with how young I was, this was like, this just blew my mind, you know. And I was, I remember the day I was sitting in my grandpa's basement and my grandma and grandpa's basement watching, and it was just the coolest thing uh, to me. Now, having said that, I, I'm not going to just say that like I, Lex Luger wasn't my guy or anything, you know. I I was a big like I enjoyed Macho Man at that age, um, people like this, but, but when I started to become really kind of like obsessed with with wrestling uh you know was about i was 10 11 years old it was about the time the monday night wars were starting and uh sting in wcw just just became my guy uh 100 percent for like three or four years there he was the only guy i cared about um just completely obsessed with him and uh so he kind of yeah got me started I, I grew up in the era of uh, colorful face paint sting and sure, you know, yeah. in NWA country in Virginia. So there were times where I would, you know, World War Three. I don't know if you remember those from the WCW. I went to two or three, oh, two yeah. of those in Norfolk Scope. I remember going to one of the Starcades. The, you know, I've got pictures oh, of when I was a little kid great. with the Rock and Roll Express. So I can definitely relate. <laughs> and actually, true story, Monday Night Wars uh, in 1996, 97. So my senior year in high school, the Monday Night Wars are just they're going on. There was yeah. Raw in Hampton, Nitro in Norfolk. I couldn't get tickets oh, to yeah. Raw. That was closer. So I got in the car and I went. I was on my way to Nitro in Norfolk. I got in a car accident on the way. I couldn't even see it. Oh, my gosh. That ended my streak. Oh. I had seen like every professional wrestling event in the area from like 86, 87. But uh, anyway, before oh, yeah. we get back into this, I want to talk a little bit about the Olympic experiences. We had the opening ceremonies on sure. August the 5th. You, one of your really good friends and teammates, Andy Bisick, on the team, keeping that Minnesota Storm streak alive. And oh, yeah. uh, you know, going back to your memories of London, what what was the biggest part about your preparation in going into the games? I mean, what were the nerves like uh, having previously been on a world team? I mean, what is the Olympic experience like for those who just can't quite understand what it is? So for me, and it's kind of, it's sort of kind of hard to explain sometimes, but once I made the team, uh, as you can imagine, there was just like this whole weight lifted off my shoulders. It was a very kind of 
like stressful period in my life leading up to the Olympic trials. And it was just this thing I chased for so long. So now training for the Olympics after that, when I knew I was on the team and I had my spot, it wasn't that I wasn't training hard, but there was a sense of relief there for me that I knew I had made it. Um, and so the goal, I just had to focus on that one tournament, you know, not these other guys in America anymore. I was just done with that. So in a way it was kind of nice. Um, and we went over there, you know, a little bit early. Uh, we were there for opening ceremonies. I know the Greco team didn't do that uh, this time. They stayed back. So I think, and, and to be honest, like that was the opening ceremonies is one of my favorite parts of the whole experience, obviously for anyone that watches it, you can see it's just a, an incredible spectacle. Um, so I feel a little bad that those guys aren't going to get to experience that. But at the same time, you know, I have the feeling it has a lot to do with their training program and just maybe a new philosophy. And, uh, so I'm just like fully confident that the decision they made is going to be good for, for their, uh, their competition in the long run. And I'm pretty sure they're sticking around for closing ceremonies anyway. So they'll still get to experience, you know, part of that. And, uh, but yeah, I'm looking really forward to it. I think those guys are going to kill it over there. When you see a guy like Andy come through, and when you guys were coming through the Minnesota wrestling scene, uh, you had the credentials, and it was, you know, Andy's senior year, he placed seventh in Fargo and ultimately ends up going to Northern Michigan instead of Minnesota State Mankato. And, uh, you know, when you look back at, at y'all's career path, then are you surprised by his ascension and, and his dominance to become one of the best Greco Roman wrestlers in the world and w- come home with a couple medals uh, in back to back years? I mean, what about Andy's? rise to Greco-Roman prominence uh, is surprising. What part of it isn't surprising? Um, I'm not surprised that he has gotten where he is. If you know Andy, uh, you you wouldn't, like anybody that knows the real Bezik would not be surprised either. He's the most like tenacious guy I've ever met. And he just is a grinder just in life, you know, not just in wrestling, but in everything. Um, and it, you know, you mentioned that seventh place at Fargo, which was kind of like, you know, the first, credential he added to his list is uh all american and it's so funny because someone posted an article the other day about him that i was reading and it's got that picture of him uh at fargo that year with his with his plaque seventh place plaque and it was so funny because and we used to joke about this all the time and we still do uh you know we've got all these pictures of uh the team that year which we had a pretty good team that year and i don't remember exactly what we placed but we had team photos for everybody that all american and, and he wasn't in any of them and we were kind of like, why is that? And then all of a sudden, like, you know, someone was like, Oh, Hey, that kid's got a, that kid's got a seventh place black too. And he's, uh, he's got a storm jacket. He must, and like, they didn't even know, you know, it's just these And he pulled out this great, like, I think he went on a great run there just to play seventh, Um, just enough where Yvonne had told him, you know, if you take seventh or higher, you can come to Northern Michigan, not on scholarship, you know, just to use the facilities, pay your own way. And so he did exactly what he needed to do. And then that's just a prime example of like, you know, he's going to get the job done and he's always been that way. And, you know, he, after 2012, just really like came out of his shell and just started breaking through in a way that like you used to watch, I think guys in the past do that. Like the guys like Dennis Hall, Brandon Paulson, uh, Rulon, and these guys that were at the top for just such a long time and just dominating for such a long time. And he's kind of, you know, taken on one of those legendary statuses in Greco Roman wrestling, you know, in this country. And I'm just like, (laughs) I'm just couldn't be happier for him. You know, there's nobody in my opinion in the world that deserves it more than he does. Uh, Just, just couldn't be happier. What was y'all's relationship like prior to going to Northern? I mean, being from him, being from Chaska, you being from Albertville, not that far away geographically, but I mean, was there, was there a friendship or, I mean, obviously you guys kind of knew each other, but uh, what was that relationship like before heading up to Marquette? Yeah. So we, uh, we had known each other since high flyers, which I would probably put it around fourth grade, maybe fourth or fifth grade uh, became a little closer as the years went by. And then by the time we got into high school, um, especially sophomore, junior year, we had become really close friends, um, you know, and that was just through wrestling. Like we'd only see each other at practices and, and tournaments, but when you wrestle as much as we did at that age, that ends up being quite a bit, you know what I mean? Um, and so then we would do all, obviously all the trips in the summer. Uh, we, we'd be wrestling everything, you know, cadet duels, junior duels, uh, 
Fargo and we'd always want to be roommates and, and hang out. And, um, by the time we, it came time to graduate, uh, you know, Andy was kind of, was like, felt similar to me in that Greco Roman was kind of like his favorite style. He had the most fun wrestling that style. And I was at Fargo and I knew he was planning on going to Mankato and we just kind of were talking and I was like, well, you know, there are opportunities there. If you want to try to talk to Yvonne and, and see if you can come and do this, the same thing I'm doing. And I think once he kind of heard more about it and, and realized what, what was possible, he just didn't really have any other thought in his mind. He just thought he needed to do that. And I think it turned out to be probably one of the best decisions he's ever made. You know, there's a talk about, you know, Spencer Mango almost went to Truman State. Uh, Andy almost went to Mankato. What, what were the collegiate options that you were kind of entertaining uh, if you wouldn't have gone to Northern Michigan? Well, the only place I visited was Augsburg. Okay. And uh, if I'm being completely honest, I never planned on going there. Uh, I never really planned on doing anything other than Russell Greco. Uh, it, from, from the time I first started, which was a, a fifth grade, maybe possibly sixth, was my first Greco match. That was it for me. Like for my style of wrestling, uh, I love throws. I love using my hips. I hate defending my legs. Uh, I hate having to escape from bottom. It just, <laughs> it was my favorite for a number of reasons. And, uh, you know, I, I only ever wrestled Greco at Fargo, um, because it's the style that I cared about the most. And I wanted to put my effort into that style as opposed to just dividing it up into different places. So, you know, I had known, I think, from about my junior year of Fargo, which is when my dad and I kind of discovered this Northern Michigan thing and first talked to Yvonne, I knew from that moment that uh, I was going to end up at Northern. Yeah, what do you remember about some of those Fargo battles? I mean, winning winning Fargo has got to be a big deal and, and then setting yourself up for a solid career. Usually in college, you're like, all right, I've done well in Fargo. I can pick where I want to go in college. In Greco, you know, you've got Northern set up, and that was part of that first, second wave of, of Greco-Roman athletes that started making world and Olympic teams. And you're kind of seeing Andy is one of the, the, the last guys left. I know Provisor spent a year there, but uh, and, and Robbie also spent some time there. But, you know, when it comes to Greco-Roman wrestling in this country, it was that group, that that crew of Northern Michigan athletes that really kind of changed the game in this country. Yeah. Uh, what a unique kind of period of time. It's like, uh, like you, like you talked about everybody's kind of different paths, but we all met up there. And, and a lot of that, in my opinion, had to do with Yvonne. Yvonne was incredible. Like even more than maybe he gets credit for a lot of times he was, uh, you know, the best coach in the country at the time. If you look at what he did, who he took, and what they turned into in such a short period of time, it's, it's pretty incredible. And, uh, you know, I, and Harry Lester also, you know, had a lot to do with kind of changing the mentality up there along with Spencer, you know, Harry started making world teams in maybe old five was his first. I can't remember. Um, but anyway, it was like when you start seeing a guy that you're training with every day, he, he's making these world teams, but this is supposed to be a developmental place. Well, everybody kind of starts thinking, no, we don't need to just be a developmental, you know, uh, training center. We could really continue to make teams at different weights and like be a powerhouse. We could be the place that people want to come train. And before you know it, it wasn't this place that, you know, Yvonne had to beg people to come and train at. It became like this place that people were begging him to give me a spot. You know what I mean? Let me train there because he was producing the best guys for years and years right there. It's pretty awesome. Let's go back to 09 in the, uh, the world team in Denmark, one of the smaller uh, venues that it's been. And, of course, the stories that go around with Denmark with uh, the trailers at 8 Mile and the small town. And, you know, what, what do you remember about your, your first world championship experience? Um, I really enjoyed myself. I enjoyed the training. Uh, I enjoyed how early we went over there and got time to acclimate uh, and things like that. Uh, my performance was obviously not what I wanted. Uh, and I don't know if I was overwhelmed. I, to be honest, I don't recall that well, but it just didn't go my way. Um, and I, I was severely disappointed. I remember it just seems like so much work to put in, you know, to only wrestle. I think I only wrestled four minutes that day. And it's just like, ah, oh, dang it. But it's as with anything else, you know, you just have to use it and, and use it to push forward and keep growing. And I think we did that. I learned some pretty valuable lessons from that. 
<laughs> what about Eight Mile? Because that's a story that doesn't really seem to get talked about anymore. I remember Mo Mir talking. He was like, "Hey, what are you saying? Oh, Eight Mile." It just became the joke because of these these trailers that were all on the grounds about what about a quarter mile, half yeah. mile away. It was <laughs> Angle was talking. To, it's like so, this little place in Denmark and these all these trailers everywhere. So I think that's where they put the training partners, right? Whoever came along, because I remember Bezik was talking about that a lot. I think I only saw it once, which from the sounds of it was probably enough for me. Maybe yeah. there's a reason I only saw it <laughs> once. But uh, yeah, I do remember hearing quite a few stories. Um, probably not the most ideal living conditions, but uh, you know, if, and if you've been to enough overseas trips and for wrestling and stuff, you've probably, I'd venture to say you may have seen worse in the past, but yeah, I heard that was not ideal. All right, as we, as we focus on the Olympics, as we've got uh, Greco-Roman wrestling kicks off August the 14th, three straight days of Greco, two days of women, three days of freestyle. The Olympic experience, you talked about the march and the, and the opening ceremonies being one of the most memorable factors. What about the Olympic Village in London? Because uh, when I'm in London, we the training partners in the USA staff and everybody, we were over at the University of East London. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's, you know, a little ways, uh, I think, two train stops from the yeah. Excel. And, you know, you get the athletes get to go to the Olympic Village. And what was that whole experience? Just to be like, all right, dude, I'm in the Olympic Village. I mean, what is what's it like inside there? Because they don't let people like me in there. Oh, the, the energy in there is like the first thing you notice and it just doesn't go away. There's just this, uh, kind of aura of everybody that just feels like, you know, we're here, like we we made it. Um, the job's not done yet, but there's just so much excitement and you can just feel it (laughs) from, you know, you don't speak anybody, anybody else's language, but you just feel, or you can just see like how excited everybody is and the anticipation that's building. Um, you know, those facilities were so great. They, they had everything in there that you would need. We, we wrestled, you know, we went to wrestle somewhere else so we could get out of there once in a while, but they had incredible gyms in there, you know, saunas, different massage rooms, training rooms, places to relax, video game rooms, every, everything you could think of, um, just to make it, you know, as comfortable as possible for everybody so that you, you can focus on your competition and not, not anything else. It was, it was pretty sweet setup. All right, and this is a family show, so I, I'm uh, be careful with the answers here. But like, okay, so but the fifth, sixth day in there, there's people that are done. I mean, how sure. rowdy does it get in there? And and are those uh, gift packages, uh, you know, from what you've seen, were, were they actually utilized? I think I know what you're referring to. I don't think I got one of those packages. I, you know, I wish I had some great story about some crazy antics that people were getting into or that I witnessed, but to be honest, like it was, it was pretty chill for the whole time. Like I have a feeling that if you wanted to go and find some entertainment to get yourself into, you could easily have done that. (laughs) But as far as I'm concerned, like it was quiet. Everybody was respectful. Um, and yeah, I didn't quite get all that vibe that everybody seems to want to think that goes on there. Yeah, I, I'm just 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 curious because uh, no, I mean yeah. it's it's not like the athletes are going to kiss and tell here, and, and you're a happily sure, married sure. man. You're not going to throw anybody under the bus. I'm just you know just no, curious if you not. saw anything. But anyway, as as we shift gears a little bit back to what you're doing now, when did the opportunity really arise? Uh, actually, let's back that up because you had to sure. actually fight for this opportunity. You had done some pro wrestling kind of at the local regional level here in Minnesota, but you had to kind of fight for the opportunity to even get noticed by the WWE. Sure. Uh, so once I retired, uh, from Greco Roman wrestling or decided to be done, um, I was moving back home with Christy and my wife in Minnesota and kind of thinking about my next move. And, uh, you know, I started doing a little bit of, of pro wrestling training at a place close to my, where Christy, where Christy had an apartment at the time. Um, so I sat down with Christy one night and asked her, I said, I'd like to try to chase this dream down because a lot of people don't know this, but I had wanted to wrestle for WWE a long before, you know, the Olympics were really a thought. I'm talking when I was a kid, when I was talking about being a big Sting fan and stuff, he made me want to wrestle and like, just never seemed like a viable option for whatever reason. It just seems so out there. And now that I thought, well, you know, I've got a little bit of credentials. I've got something that I can maybe make work for myself why not give it a shot? And so I asked Christy to give me one year to chase it down and try to figure out what, what kind of path you have to take to do this stuff. Cause I was clueless. And then, uh, 
and we'll see if we can make it work. And it ended up taking 13 months. But so, but I think she forgave that because it actually worked out pretty good. But I had to get in touch with, uh, with Jerry Briscoe, who does some of the amateur recruiting for WWE. Um, you know, and he let me know flat out, like your size is going to be an issue. You're, you're small. Uh, you're a lot smaller than we usually ever take for this, for what we do here. Um, he's usually recruiting heavyweights and things like that, obviously. Um, but I got my chance. I got a tryout, uh, in May of 2013 and, uh, and it went, I don't think it could have gone any better. I, I made sure and, you know, trained hard for it cause I didn't know really what to expect or what they had us do. Um, and it worked out and I got a call back about six weeks later saying they're going to hire me. Uh, and I was told, you know, you, are going to be one of the smallest guys we have. So you better make sure you plan on being the best. And I said, okay. And then I started in November of 2013. So what, what's your walking around weight? Because we know that uh, much like professional football and college football rosters, the weights <laughs> might be slightly inflated. But uh, according to your sure. Wikipedia page, uh, Chad Gable checks in at five foot eight, build at 202 pounds. What, what are you typically walking around at? Oh, so it fluctuates, uh, depending on our travel schedule and just things like that. But I would say anywhere between 190, 195, depending on the day. But yeah, somewhere in there. So that's not too far off. So if, if, um, if we were to classify this from the Monday Night Wars, uh, you, you'd, you'd be in the, you'd be the old cruiserweight division. Sure. Yeah. But you could give me, like, you could give me 220 back then, I think. And I'd be comfortable with that. I think 225 or less was the weight class then. Yeah, so you get into this situation, and then how quickly, and from uh, you know peeling the doors out, you know, you know the the world of professional wrestling is not as um, protective of its storylines as much as it's used to, as it used to be. You know, uh, breaking kayfabe is not necessarily a bad thing anymore. But when we look at the development of your persona within NXT and the WWE and the developmental leagues, where did where did it's, it's, it's an easy story you've told me before, but where does Chad Gable come from? Where, where did this name, how much input did you have in this? So they asked me for a list of names uh, probably two months in when I started here. And I, you know, I don't know if I was just trying to be smart or witty or, or I don't know what I was thinking, but I gave him a list. I should have had it out. I wish I had it somewhere, but of 30 of like the most embarrassing humiliating names at the time. I thought they were so cool. Well, and you know, Bastion now, Booger was already taken. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they were pretty, they weren't much better than that. I'm going to be honest. And uh, yeah, I've looked back at that list since then. And I'm just like, thank God they didn't go with any of these, but uh, they shut my list down. I submitted more names. They shut it down. Um, and then after a while they came to me and I saw an email on someone's phone. They showed me and they said, what do you think of the name Chad Gable? And there was like, no question in my mind at that point. They just nailed it. And it's funny because I don't know why, you know, why wouldn't I think of doing something like that? I just didn't feel comfortable, you know, taking that name on my own. You know what I mean? Um, but since then, you know, he seemed to uh, not necessarily disapprove of it. I think there's a, he sent a video uh, with the towel, the Gable towel, doing the catchphrase, the ready, willing, Gable catchphrase. Uh, so that made me feel quite a bit better when I saw that he's not, <laughs> no, he's pretty supportive of the whole thing. Uh, so yeah, that was actually them that gave me the name and I just accepted it. Were you worried about the feedback that you might get from the kind of traditionalists in the wrestling community? Because when after Kurt Angle won gold in 96 and breaks out, there were a lot of people that were calling him a sellout, that he was he was making sure. a mockery of amateur wrestling. And I think in, in what we've seen, at least in the last 10 years, that that issue between professional wrestling fans and or more or less uh, college and, and international wrestling fans towards professional wrestling isn't as as uh, full of vitriol as much as it used to be. But what were your concerns about getting into this and, and as far as respecting your your history as an amateur wrestler? Sure. Yeah, I didn't have I wasn't worried at all about that. Um, I think everybody can kind of agree that, you know, that kind of stigma or whatever has gone out the window. Um you know, over the past, however many years, you know, like for the most part, the people that whose opinions I value and things like that, they all knew that this was something that I was into something that I'd wanted to do for a long time and something that I was passionate about. So to them, it was no surprise. And there was, 
you know, it, they, they were very supportive and, and everything. And I didn't really get any of that backlash. I think everybody, you know, even people that I haven't spoke to for a long time have been very supportive and, and just think it's awesome that, that you chase a dream. I don't think it's so much about that anymore. People just kind of, uh, you know, everyone's been really supportive. Did they make you grow the hair or was this something that was a, of your own design? The, that was my design. Uh, I don't really have a good reason for why it started, but I just wanted to do it. And I haven't cut it in over two years, I think. Uh, you know, and that's where the headbands came from, too. They came, started out of necessity um, because my hair was constantly in my eyes when I was training and it was becoming a big issue. And then before you know it, people are like, well, you should just, you know, make that a part of your ring gear and, and whatever. So now you're going to be hard pressed to find me without the headband on. It's kind of part of, part of who I am now. All right. Uh, during Fargo, uh, we're, we're, we're sitting there at the junior nationals and, you know, Pete Kowalczyk one day is wearing his American alpha shirt. Uh, (laughs) Carrie Regner is trying to, these are Northern guys in case, uh, those of you are trying to understand the background here. Carrie Regner's trying to like, dude, we got to have a draft party. And I'm like, (laughs) dude, we're busy, man. They they wanted to have a draft party. And then all of a sudden, boom, you and your tag team partner with American alpha, Jason Jordan go to SmackDown. And for, Mm -hmm. for those understanding what this is and that, that might, might not be professional wrestling fans. Uh, there's there's Raw and there's SmackDown within the WWE. You're coming from NXT, which is the developmental show, which you can see on Hulu and various uh, cable networks. But what was this process like? And and were you anticipating uh, that that's like wow this this is going to be big for for my career? I mean, personally, not necessarily as Chad Gable the character, but as Chaz Betts the person. Right. Yeah. So okay, a few things here. Um, what we were in was NXT. Uh, my partner and I we were in a tag team called American Alpha. Now NXT used to be known as they used to call it developmental, but it's since in the last couple of years kind of taken on its own life, and it's what now it's a third brand. So you have Raw on Mondays, SmackDown on Tuesdays, and then you have NXT. It's just like it's third it's third brand because it's gotten so popular over these last couple of years. And uh, Jason and I have been fortunate enough to at least over the past year, be a big part of that. Um, It it really started blowing up right almost when I got down here, thanks to a lot of the guys that were already here grinding away for for years and years. And then, um, you know, Jason and I started tag teaming last summer. And almost a year to the date, uh, you know, we were sitting in the the PC performance center watching the draft because we all had kind of our own little draft party at NXT that night in the performance center and on the big screen, you know, we saw and heard Daniel Bryan say our name and draft us. And, and people always want to know, like, you know, did you guys know you guys must've known beforehand? And we, we had no idea. Uh, they didn't tell us anything. It was just kind of like they sit everybody in there. And all we knew was that six people from NXT were getting drafted and, uh, we would just had our fingers crossed to be one of them. And, you know, we couldn't be happier. Jason, Jason, for those that don't know, has been doing this since uh, 2000, maybe late 2011. So five years is a long time to be in NXT. And he's tried a lot of different stuff and things just haven't worked out for him. But I'm just so happy that it finally did and that I'm the one that can help be a part of it with him and and be alongside him as we we take this next step. And for those who are... Understate. Jason Jordan wrestled at Indiana uh, as his yeah. real name, Nathan Everhart, in a couple, you know, national qualifier. So, and and that also yeah. brings to the next point. There's a couple uh, names that people would know right now. I, I thought this was funny the other day. I was I was on Twitter and I saw a picture of Nico Bogajevich in the ring oh, with yeah. Sonny Dinsa, and I'm like, oh, and, and yeah. Dozer loves this stuff. And I'm like, dude, those guys wrestled each other like the Division Two West Regionals like <laughs> two years ago. <laughs> And, you know, yeah. Sonny's on a junior world team for Canada wrestling at like Simon yeah. Frazier. And I'm like, this is just you've got that. You've got uh, other people. Levi Cooper is all American Arizona States yep. in there. Yep. Uh, Adrian Joe, uh, the Brazilian. He was, a, a, I believe, a world yep. team member multiple times. I mean, you've you've got wrestlers coming in. And I remember the world team trials in Daytona. I came over to uh, to full sale for an NXT taping. That was not a good experience for me. But uh, that's another story oh, yes. entirely. But uh, okay. there was. There was a tryout camp that weekend, so I'm standing outside sure. trying to get in. I see I see Clayton Jack, who was at the time Cal Bishop, and then the yeah. first person I see is Eric Thompson, who is you know uh-huh. the, the, from Grandview, and then all these heavyweights. I'm like, there's Ernest James. I was like, I remember that. I helped <laughs> with that tryout. I remember that. Yeah. 
there's so many these these heavyweights like Eric Thomas like yeah I'm rooming with the guy I beat in the NAIA finals and it was like and then yeah. they're they're telling me about the performance center so from your perspective the performance center this place is under lockdown this is like oh, nothing's yeah. getting out of here explain that experience as or much not. as uh, as much as you can yeah it's kind of like it's not open to the public that's not what it's for uh, it's for us to create new stars you know what I mean and uh, what we do do is. About every four months, I would say, three to four months, we host what's called like a PC All Access. So Performance Center All Access, where you can pay uh, whatever the m- amount of money is, I can't remember, and then you get to come in. And basically, the idea is you experience a day in the life of, of one of us. Um, and we just did one two weeks ago, actually, and these things are great. You know, people show up right when we do in the morning, and they basically get a run through a full day, uh, and they do exactly what we would do. Um, and at the end of the day, we end up putting a show on in the performance center for them to watch. They all get to be a part of it. You know, some are guest ring announcers, some are managers, things like that. Wait, wait, what, really what? Ring cool. announcers? Ring announcers? Oh, yeah. Really now? No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Timekeepers, we got the whole deal. Uh, so it, it's really awesome. Like, for those that want to really come experience it, they get that opportunity. But, you know, besides those, it's really not, that's not what its purpose is for. It's not for the public. It's for us to get in there, work, learn, and just do, and, and trust me when I say it has everything you would possibly need in there. It has everything you need to work on your interviews, to your in-ring work, to the gym is incredible in there, um, to the kitchen, everything's incredible. Um, yeah, it's, it's a pretty sweet, pretty sweet little venue. Yeah, and, and Eric was saying, it's like, yeah, dude, I haven't checked my phone in like three days. I mean, it, the no electronics, from what I understand. You're, yeah, you're, they you're... frown on that big time. They don't want you, you know, and that's completely understandable that what goes on in there is, is supposed to stay in there. And uh, and so far, I think they've done a pretty good job. Now, as, as we get into the new era of Chad Gable on SmackDown, uh, interesting. Yeah. You, you talked about the names with Gable, and the first thing I thought about was watching the uh, the clip from SmackDown uh, against the Vaudevillians, which I think is uh, not watching professional wrestling as much as I used to growing up. I was like, oh, that's that's kind of uh, that's kind of clever. And then using the last name Gotch, I'm like, well, that's that oh, goes yeah. right in line with what you were talking about. But what was oh, that yeah. experience like, SmackDown? I mean, this is this is one of the major brands within, you know, millions of people watch this. People subscribe to the network specifically to watch the WWE. I mean. Was that mm-hmm. where, where was the what was the moment like when that that bell rang? You're like, whoa, okay, I'm 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 just Chaz from <laughs> Albertville. I'm yeah. I'm on TV now. <laughs> so that was uh, it. Kind of started, you know, before right before we came out of the curtain, the nerve. And we've been doing a lot of these shows with NXT with with bigger venues. You know what I mean? Like we've been fortunate enough at times to wrestle in front of a lot of people. So it wasn't such a shock that the crowd was bigger, but the the moment itself was bigger. It was, it's your chance for the first time ever to go on live TV and show people who you are. And so there was a little bit of, you know, really good, uh, you know, in the best possible way, nervousness, excitability that whole day. And Jason and I just wanted to make sure that, you know, we need to make sure that however long we have out there, however long it lasts, when we leave, we make sure that they get a really, really good look and a, a glimpse into who we are because, you know, you only get one debut and you don't get a do over. And so we needed to make a count. We were really happy. I think we did. Um, you know, and I don't know how long it lasted, but it seemed like it lasted five seconds, stuff like that just goes so fast. And as we came out of the curtain, the nerves kind of melt away, you know, it's that time building up to it. And it's the time right before your music hits that you're the most nervous, but then, as soon as you're out there, you kind of just do what you what you've been doing for years now, and uh, before you know it, we were in the back and just kind of like really happy with it all. Now, having known you for a number of years, it, it didn't really. And getting to know you later on, it's like okay, I, the, the personality is there. But for people who don't know, uh, with Greco Roman mm-hmm. really not getting a lot of the exposure, uh, Chaz Betts, the Greco Roman athlete, didn't have that many media opportunities for people to understand your personality or your talents, especially right. with like digital mediums and video and things like that. I mean, you're a funny guy. You're pretty sarcastic. Yep. But people didn't get to get to see that. Are are people surprised by the fact that you can just kind of flip a switch and like I'm watching you on TV? I'm like, okay, that may that's a little bit more than I expected at a, at, at a yeah. you. I mean, how do you develop that type of, uh, you know, the, the, like in the NXT era when you're trying to convince sure. Jason Jordan to take you on in that that storyline, yeah. the whiny please pick me type of thing. Yeah. Where do you come up yeah. with that? 
so that is one of the hardest things I think, and I don't want to speak for, for the, anybody else, but at least coming from amateur wrestling, I think that's one of the hardest things obviously to develop is this willingness to like allow yourself to, you know, not necessarily look stupid, but yeah, you know, act a little dumb sometimes or, or just let go. I always compare it to acting how I would act if I was just only in front of my family, you know, the people I trust the most in the world. I am definitely not afraid to be dumb in front of them, act a little goofy, um, say stupid stuff. And so sometimes when I'm trying to get into this stuff, I just think like, just imagine that you're just there with your family and then it kind of makes itself easy. Uh, and cause the thing you got to realize is, you know, it's really easy to kind of act like a tough guy. You know what I mean? Uh, we were taught for a long time, you know, in amateur wrestling, you don't want to show any emotion. You don't want to, especially when you're on the mat, you don't want to give the guy, your opponent, any look into how you're feeling or, or if you're tired or, or exhausted, whatever you're feeling. So you're just kind of stone faced, uh, you know, looking like a tough guy or acting tough is really not that hard in my opinion. Plus how many of those do we need? You know what I mean? Like when you're, you've got Brock Lesnar on your roster, like he's probably the scariest human being, one of the scariest human beings alive. So how tough are you going to look? You know what I mean? So I think it's kind of cool to just say, I'll let myself go once in a while and just be willing to look a little goofy. So maybe when the bell rings, that all goes away. Maybe when the bell rings, I need to be serious and just really, really show what I can do. But outside of the ring, you know, all is fair game in my opinion. How much did the actual wrestling part of it growing up help you with, with some of the moves and taking the bumps? And uh, I'm watching clips. I'm like, I don't, re you know, seeing a Greco Roman wrestler do backflips, this makes me like, wait a minute. The, you, where did they get that athletic? I mean, where does that, that tumbling ability come from? You don't see that in Greco, uh, save yeah. Rulon's cartwheel. But I mean, yeah. where did that come from? I mean, how much of a tumbling and, and, you know, that type of athletic background did you really have uh, even while you were wrestling? You didn't get to show it very much. Uh, no, not, I mean, we would always do, especially with Yvonne and stuff, we would always do some sort of tumbling to warm up. He was big on that. Um, but even before that, I couldn't tell you how much time, uh, I spent on the trampoline as a kid. I used to love that stuff. Um, and it just, you know, it's just not really the kind of thing that you just show. So, but we, we did that a lot in, in warm ups and things with Yvonne and in Colorado. And then here they stress it big time. Every um in ring practice starts with like forty minutes of rolls and moving and tumbling and different things like that. And that happens every day. That's not like a once a week type thing just to work on your tumbling. That's every single day that you're in the ring, you warm up for at like forty minutes with rolls and tumbling. So it's kinda of hard not to at least get a feel for that, you know, when you're doing it every day. And as far as the actual uh you know, wrestling goes like, I couldn't tell you how much the amateur wrestling helped with my footwork and just my sense of, you know, my, my awareness in there, like where I am and my ability to feel, you know, wrestling was very responsible for, for me being able to pick this up the way that I did. When you look at the professional wrestling world and its opportunity that uh, has given you and the, you know, the other wrestlers that I've mentioned, at least with an opportunity, a tryout. I mean, Hey, try it out. If you don't like it, you know, go, go an Olympic circuit and the, Hey, we'll, we'll, we'll be sure. here. But you know, people see the MMA and they're still giving the MMA uh, more of a, a, a route say, okay, this is a viable option. Do you think professional wrestling gets a bad rap when it comes to being a, a certifiable career option for wrestlers once they've competed or completed their Olympic aspirations? Um, I don't know what kind of rap it gets. I hope it doesn't because it's certainly been a really big positive for me and my family. Um, you know, I, it's afforded me the chance to live in Florida for a few years, which I can't say that I ever would have done otherwise. Um, I've traveled to, you know, I always like to say like how, how much amateur wrestling allowed me to travel, uh, which I was so fortunate to travel the world, you know, and then we're already experiencing that again with, with, with WWE. Since I've been here, I've gone on tours to the UK twice. I've been to India, which I've never been to before. Um, so it's, I don't know how people really look at it. I just know how I do. And it's that so far it's been the most, like, most incredible couple of years, you know, that I can remember. And, um, I just can't, I'm just looking forward. I just want it to last as long as possible.
If you had Jerry Briscoe's job, and I see Jerry a lot at at wrestling events, we had you know we have dinner probably two three times a year at various wrestling events. Mm-hmm. Talk, and I get I get to be a mark a little bit. I get to talk about the old days. Sure. I mean, I think I watched the Ultimate Warrior versus the Honky Tonk Man from SummerSlam '88 probably <laughs> yeah. once a week. Um, there you go. I'm okay. kind of outing myself there. Honestly, I'm, I'm no no bull crap. I actually watched that clip yeah, uh, quite frequently. Um, but when if you had the chance to look at wrestling right now, the the college and the, and the international ranks, like who are some people you're like, wow, okay, that guy's got the personality. I want. I think he could do really well in this business. Uh, well, I have like tipped off these guys a couple times and just like you know said, what do you think of this guy? This guy um, before you know. Well, Robbie Smith, obviously, I think is a character that comes across to everybody. Anybody that interacts with him or sees him would never forget him, you know, and you'd only need to meet him once. And that's the kind of quality that are uh, in people that I think they're looking for here. Uh, Robbie's just this, like, like this overwhelming personality in the best possible way. And he's a big dude. And, you know, he's got a great look with the beard. I think he'd be incredible. Uh, someone else I've kind of mentioned to them in, a couple of times was, uh, Lopez from Cuba, um, just because of without even speaking, um, he's got a presence about him that is just kind of, yeah, it's just got an aura about him. If you're around him, you just kind of feel like this guy, this guy's someone special. Um, and I, I think most people that have been around him could attest to that. And he's got a great look too. Um, I just don't know what the logistics are of getting a, a guy from Cuba here, but <laughs> and he's gigantic. But, I mean, he's just yeah, so big. Massive. Yeah. And, uh, but, uh, and when it comes to some, like the more recent guys, and you mentioned Nico, uh, <laughs> Nico has fit in here so quickly. Um, he's picked it up so quickly and he is just perfect for this. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, Nico, he's about my height, which is, you know, five, eight, whatever, but he's as wide as a house. He is about 300 plus pounds but he moves like a guy, like a, he moves like a smaller guy. He's very agile and his character and just personality is out of this world. And he's, uh, he's got a lot of fans here already. I think he's going to be someone to watch out for. Yeah. Watching some of his clips. I, I look at him as kind of like a modern day Bam Bam Bigelow with how he moves. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and Dozer, we people might remember him as he wins Greco heavyweight and does the worm across the mat yeah, in Fargo. There you go. There you go. So yeah, I'm not so, surprised yeah. one bit that he's in this. As a matter of fact, it, it just it yeah. it actually puts a smile on my face because I'm like, go get him, Dozer, just because it's yeah, it's he's going to be great. I promise he's going to be great. Now, as we look at Minnesota and how there's such a great wrestling tradition, I mean, uh, the Minnesota Storm has been on every Olympic team since 1968, and it's got such a great professional wrestling tradition with uh, what the Ganya started with the AWA, and then you know guys like the Iron Sheik have come through here, Brad Rangins. You know, you, you can't mention. Uh, the AWA in the seventies and eighties was just such a big part of professional wrestling. And it's, it's this state, Minnesota is so uh, tight with that. I mean, there's a book about the history of Minnesota wrestling. Half of it's about professional wrestling and it's not like, and it's seamless. What's it mean to you to one, be able to represent the Minnesota storm at the Olympic games and two, be able to represent such a great state with a proud professional wrestling history as well. Yeah. It's so first of all, with the Olympic thing that the importance that of that to me is like, I just couldn't uh, put it into words because I know how important that is to other people, to the people that came before me and people like Bezik, um, to the Dan Chandlers, the coaches that have kept that alive all these years that have been producing these athletes and to the guys that made the team and let that continue. So it's not just like that we did it for ourselves. It's not that we're just happy that we did it. You know, you did that for a number of people and to help like keep this great <laughs> streak alive. And so that was awesome. And then to be a part of, of this Minnesota wrestling tradition, which, you know, I, maybe as of late, it doesn't get so much mentioned because just because of the way things are, but it'd be great to like kind of bring that back. You know what I mean? We've got guys, we've got another guy from Minnesota here uh, who played football for the Gophers, who's going to be incredible. Um, and I just think that'd be awesome to like start getting talk again, going about Minnesota's tradition and, and kind of the throwbacks to all that stuff and just like really uh, keep that going as well and be a part of it. And to have our names be there on a list along with some of those great guys, you know, all the guys that went to Robbinsdale and everybody that trained and came to the AWA, it'd just be, uh, be pretty awesome. 
All right, I do a segment on Short Time, which is one of my flagship programs on the Mad Talk Podcast Network. It's called Short Time. I'm going to bring it over to the Guillotine Grapevine here, and I want a professional wrestling angle here. I don't want to. I don't want the the college or international style of things. I want answers to be professional wrestling based here. So, are you ready? Ten questions in ninety seconds. Okay. All right, what's the best match you've ever watched? Uh, Owen versus Brett. Okay. Man in yeah, okay. So uh, you win the World Heavyweight Championship. What do you have for dinner that night? I have a ribeye steak. Easy. Who's Plain. the Who's the best wrestler people don't talk about? All time. Ooh, all time. Uh, people don't talk about. Underrated. I'll say a guy named Tommy Rogers. I remember Tommy Rogers. Uh, there you go. All-time favorite flavor of Gatorade. That's that's an all-sports question. What's the purple one? Uh, purple something. Purple, the purple lighter, stuff's good. That's fine. The lighter purple one, yeah. yeah. I think it's like rain, some, ru- yeah. I don't know, is yeah. it Rush or something? Right. All right. Uh, this is a kind of a Rip tough one. Rush. Yeah, this is kind of a tough one because there aren't that many, uh, especially there aren't that many good ones. Best wrestling movie, professional wrestling movie. Not documentary, Ooh. not documentary. That's a different entire. This that's a different world entire. Oh, okay. Well, I really loved the wrestler from a couple of years ago. That was I know good. A lot yeah. Of different on that, but I loved it. That's good. I'm I'm gonna go with uh, what was it called? Body Slam with Roddy Piper. Okay. I and gotcha. I think I think I think Haku, not Haku. I, one of the one of the Samoans was in it way back in the day. It was from the '80s. Oh, yeah. All right. Uh, your favorite wrestler outside of Sting and yourself. Eddie Guerrero. Okay. You, okay, that's a college wrestling question. We'll have to skip over that. Okay, I'll just throw it at you. You win the Powerball. What's the first college wrestling program you're going to start? Uh, what's the first wrestling program I'm going to start? Yeah, best first college wrestling program you're going to start if you win the Powerball. Uh, I don't know. That's uh, You know what I would do? Uh, I would probably start another kind of... Uh, Greco-Roman facility, similar to the one at NNU, just in a different region of the country. Favorite restaurant on the planet? Favorite restaurant? Cafeina, Minneapolis. Right. Best JV guy on your high school wrestling team? <laughs> Kurt Pope. What is your spirit animal? <laughs> uh, spirit animal? What's the... Uh, what's the thing that has the lion's head and then still has wings? Uh, uh, I think that's a griffin. Yeah, the Griffin. I All right. Those and I saw them. And I don't, I've lost count of the questions. What's the craziest thing yeah. Cole Shrupp has ever shoved in your freezer? Uh, a copy of Windows 10. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I just had to throw throw that that story in there somehow. It's kind of an inside joke. Yeah. But, uh, might have been Windows 7. I can't remember. But I think, it was, I think it was Windows 7 based on the story. Yeah, goes. that might be it. But uh, all right, so at time we got left, SummerSlam coming up August twenty first. Yeah. I mean, that's got. I mean, we just talked about SummerSlam here. Like eighty eight was one of like my seminal moments when the Ultimate Warrior. I mean, whatever. I mean, the ult. I mean, Finkel going nuts. I yeah. mean, it was one of my favorite professional wrestling moments of all time. And now you're going to be part of SummerSlam. I mean, what's that yeah. mean for you growing up? As I mean, for lack of a better term, we were all, we're all marks growing up. And Mark sure. means fan for those who are wondering uh, that this crossover episode, we're talking a lot of pro wrestling yeah. here, but what's it, what, what do you, I mean, how stoked are you for SummerSlam? It's incredible, especially when Jason and I look at where we were a year ago, because, okay, it's in Brooklyn um, at the Barclays Center. And so last year, NXT ran its biggest event to date at that same building. Uh, now we were on that show, but we were on kind of like what was called the pre-show. Uh, the dark so, matches? Well, it was for we we had taped it for TV, but it wouldn't air till the following week. But the event that night was live on the network, so we were kind of like we were definitely on the show. We wrestled, but we weren't a part of the huge event in the sense that we didn't wrestle live. Now all of a sudden we are on the cusp of having this opportunity to wrestle on SummerSlam in that same building, just a much bigger scale. You know, like a like more importance to us and. Uh, and it's going to be if we are on it, and we don't know if we are yet. We'll find out hopefully soon. But uh, it'd be our first big pay per view event. You know, it'd be our first chance to really, you know, get on a big a show with a lot more importance and say like, you know, we're here, like we have arrived, and we just can't wait. We want that opportunity, and uh, we hope that that's going to be the start of of something really, really great for us. 
Time we got left. Why don't you just tell people how they can follow you on social media and actually watch you on the network, uh, WWE Network. Uh, it's sure. kind of an interesting thing. We've got uh, what it's a monthly plan. A lot of cord cutters out there. They can keep up with their pro yeah. wrestling. But social media, where are you at? So Twitter.com, uh, WWE Gable is the handle. Instagram, it's Gable WWE. The other one was taken. Um, so those are the ones I'm most active on. And then, yeah, I would suggest anybody that even is a slight fan of wrestling, of WWE, you have to have the network because for the value, it's incredible. It's nine ninety nine a month. Uh, you get all the pay-per-views for free on there. Um, all these special, like, first-run new episodes and, like, original shows. Um, plus, it's, like, got every WCW, ECW, WWE pay-per-view for all of time. Um, the content is endless. You could never watch it all. It's just, uh, it's incredible. It's a great deal. All right. I want to close with this. I talked about my, 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 the most hated heel I had growing up. That was the honky tonk, man. You talked about how much you love sting. What are, who are some of the names that just, when you, when people say pro wrestling to you, that just jump out, jump out to you. So, well, at that time it would have been different. Um, at the time, you know, uh, when, like I said, when I was 10 or 11, really started to become obsessed. Like Chris Jericho rubbed me the wrong way. Like nobody has since. And, uh, and he wasn't even at his like main star prominence yet. He was just kind of being this annoying little character on WCW, like early on in the show. And for whatever reason, whatever he was doing and the way that he was doing it just bothered me to the nth degree. Like I, it forced me, it was so bad, but it was the type of bad that, I couldn't turn it off. It was making me so mad and I could not turn it off. Um, and I think that's such a great quality. And to do that to a little kid at my age then is like a really, really good talent. Um, you know, but so, yeah, I guess a guy like him would have been the guy I hated the most early on. Well, that was right um, around probably the, uh, was that, that the era? I'm trying to look at your age and figure out where we were at. That would have probably been 97, uh, I would say, right at the start of the or Okay, so he's, he's, he's on the WCW the side then. Okay, yeah, because yeah. I still remember him breaking into the WWE. It was like with The yeah, Rock and what's your, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Lionheart Chris Jericho from back way back in yeah. the day. Uh, okay, so when, when, when you see people talk about the iron, the, like the iron Sheik, you know, spent a lot of time so in Minnesota. Iron Sheik Chandler. And so like, uh, I was watching, there was a period about two years ago where I also got obsessed with him too, mostly for like some of his interview stuff and just the way he talks. And I, you know, it's pretty incredible sometimes. Uh, so I would just watch interviews and interviews and then watch some of his matches. And then, uh, funny enough, he was at TakeOver Dallas in April, uh, WrestleMania weekend, when Jason and I won the NXT tag team titles. And so it was this huge moment for Jason and I. We got backstage, and I was all excited. But, the, like, one of the first people I saw was Iron Cheek, and I, like, forgot about everything else and just ran over to him and, like, completely turned into a fan. I, it's like, I need to have a picture. Sir, will you please take a picture with me? And I dropped Dan Chandler's name to him so that he knew, you know, that I know a little bit about his history and things like that. Um, but what a guy, he was so awesome. Just thankful. I got a chance to meet him. Yeah. And do yourself a favor, folks. If you can find the iron sheiks, uh, WWE induction speech for the hall of fame oh, yeah. from, I think it was from Oh seven where he goes, hi, yeah. wrestled Brad Rangans, Dan Chandler, <laughs> Alan Rice. You know, yeah. I wrestled Dan Gable, you know, Kurt, Kurt yeah. Angle. No, I mean, it's just, it's, it's awesome from, you, uh, from a wrestling fan's perspective. Oh yeah. And he loves Minnesota. I wrestle Minnesota Wrestling Club. (laughs) AAU National Champion. (laughs) My Sheik's not bad, but anyway. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. I got to head over to to London, head down to Rio here, but I want to thank uh, Chaz Betts for you Minnesotans, Chad Gable to everybody else for coming on the Guild Team Grapevine, and uh, hey, good luck down the line. At least we know where we can find you on television. Got it. Thanks for having me, Jason. is part of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. For more wrestling podcasts, head over to matttalkonline.com.